Intel is sprinkling new motherboards on us. It's really weird this time. So there's a new CPU that comes out and motherboards. And we've got motherboards that we can talk about, but we can't talk about the performance of the 9,000 series CPUs. So I've got an 8,000 series CPU in here. This is the ASRock Z390 Tai Chi. ASRock has very quickly built a name for the Tai Chi line, basically being, you know, everything that you need, nothing that you don't know, nonsense. The Tai Chi's generally tend to be especially good boards for Linux because they use really highly supported peripherals like Intel NIX, and they don't get too fancy with like the implementation of the Realtek ALC 1220 while providing, you know, high quality connectors optical SPDIF, a pretty good headphone amplifier, the NE5532 for the front panel, all this kind of stuff. The big difference between Z370 and Z390 is that Intel is doing the USB 3.1 Gen 2 on the chipset. And even Linux support for that is pretty good because that Intel USB 3.1 Gen 2 controller first showed up with H370. So it's it's been out in the wild a little while. It's just H370 and Z370 sort of melded together is Z390 and specifically Z390 supports the higher power draw and uh, advanced features of the new 9000 series CPUs, but there's really not a lot of difference. So the motherboards are compatible with the eighth and ninth generation CPU. So if you wanted to get an 8700K and use it in a Z390, you totally could. Conversely, you can use a 9000 series CPU in a Z370 board. Now, the 9000 CP series CPUs are expected to draw quite a bit more power, even though they have a TDP rating of 95 watts, that means that the CPU is going to downclock and throttle and whatever if you want it to run in that 95 watt power envelope. But if you can deliver more power and manage the heat, you will have, you know, commensurate performance to match. So, I, you know, I, it's, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time to be alive that we're talking about high performance eight cores on the desktop and that is the conversation. And I think that, I think that Intel's competition is why we're talking about eight cores on the desktop in 2018, but uh, that's, a, that's a conversation for another day. Be sure to check out our full performance analysis, our full review of the 9000 series CPUs. I'm not gonna talk about that too much in this video because it's probably gonna come out before the 9000 series CPUs even launch. This is really just a review of this motherboard. First up, let's take a look at the rear IO. First up, we've got our antenna connections for our two x two plus Bluetooth wireless solution, a combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port, two USB three ports, display port and HDMI for the onboard iGPU, which is pretty cool. Some of the higher end motherboards for the ninth gen CPUs don't have an iGPU out. And if you're running a lot of multi-monitor and you don't wanna run multiple display, it can be pretty cool. If you're running you know, something like Linux and you wanna do GPU pass through and use the iGPU for the host system, having the display port and HDMI output mean that you can run higher end monitors. Then of course we've got two more USB 3 ports. These are the USB uh, 3, you know, uh, 3.1 Gen 1, 5 gigabit. Then we've got two USB 3.1 Gen 2 from the Intel chipset. We've got two Intel gigabit NICs, an i211AT and an i219V. The 219V of course is sort of built in to the ninth gen CPU or eighth gen CPU because you can use eighth gen CPUs on this. Then we've got our Realtek ALC 1220 based audio codec with our you know, plated audio connections for analog and optical SPDIF. The audio solution is a 7.1 audio solutions. The, the Dolby, they're the uh, Blu-ray codec support stuff is all there. It is uh, based around the Realtek ALC 1220, as I mentioned, but it also has an NE5532 uh, amplifier and Nishikon fine gold audio capacitors. All right, now in terms of board layout, we've got two PCI Express by one slots. They are open-ended on the end, so if you've got like a by four card, you can shove that in there, but it's only gonna work at a PCI Express by one speed, which may or may not impact how the card actually works. Like if you're doing 4K uncompressed capture, it'll work in a one X slot, but it won't work because there's not enough bandwidth in PCI Express by one. But maybe like an older um, network card that's like PCI Express by two, you can probably get away with running that in PCI Express by one slot. Then we've got three full armored reinforced PCI Express by 16 physical slots, but those are um, all three wired into the 16 PCI Express lanes provided by the CPU. So Z390, 
basically identical in terms of Z370, in terms of how much PCI Express connectivity you have. You have 16 PCI Express lanes through the CPU, and then you have a number of PCI Express lanes that are through the chipset, but the chipset itself is connected to the CPU only by a single PCI Express by four type connection. That's actually DMI 3.0 but it's only PCI Express by fours worth of bandwidth. So these three physical by 16 slots that right now I've got an Intel NVMe installed, a dual 10 gigabit LAN and a, and a really ancient graphics card. Those are running at by eight by four by four. So if you wanted to run SLI two graphics cards, you would have by eight by eight by zero. The, the bottom slot would, uh, would not have any lanes attached to it. Or if you wanted to run Crossfire with three cards, it would be by eight by four by four. I would not recommend running SOI with another high-speed peripheral such as an NVMe or a high-speed capture card or something like that because then one of your SOI graphics cards is going to be running it by four and that's probably too much of a bottleneck for higher end graphics cards. A by eight is just barely a little bit of a bottleneck with something like you know the 2080 or the 2080 Ti. Got to do some formal testing on that but a lot of people have done a lot of testing, us included, for the you know 1080 Ti on by 16 by eight. And generally it didn't really make much of a difference in some scenarios, it made a little bit of a difference, but the 2080 Ti may be a slightly different story, but probably not a dramatically different story in all honesty. This motherboard also has three M.2 slots, one of which includes an, an armor shield thingy. Now the shield can help dissipate heat from the NVMe controller, like the PCI, the, you know, the, the M.2 controller. Generally, the flash memory itself doesn't really care that it runs hot. In fact, it, it actually works better if it's a little bit warm because that's how flash memory works. But keeping the controller cool, but letting the chips get warm can be a little bit of a tricky thing. So there's a lot of debate on with heat spreader, without heat spreader, that sort of thing. The middle M.2 slot is under the graphics card. So you can't really see it. It will not breathe as well, especially with, with a graphics card like this or a blower style graphics card. So I would definitely topulate, topulate, that's not a word. I would definitely populate the top slot. Now we know what words that was a combination of with an M.2 first and then probably the bottom slot and then only the middle slot if I absolutely had to. Now in terms of M.2 RAID, uh, because all those M.2 slots go through the Z390 chipset, if you were to run a RAID 0 or a RAID 1, it will potentially bottleneck if you are using higher speed NVMe. We're going to do a separate video on that. We're going to do a comparison of, of M.2 RAID. However, because this bottom slot runs through the CPU and not the chipset, if you were to use one M.2 on the motherboard through the chipset and one with a, an M.2 to PCI Express adapter card in the bottom slot here, that would not bottleneck and that would let you run a RAID 0 or a RAID 1 with M.2 and get just crazy performance like six, seven gigabytes per second read if you were using the Samsung 960 Pros, which I happen to have here, which is maybe a preview of exciting things to come in terms of the whole, uh, let's, let's do it, let's do the RAID thing. Now in terms of front panel connections, we've got two USB 3.0, those are the five gigabit ports, as well as one USB 3.1 Gen 2. So one 10, 10 gigabit USB Type-C reversible front panel connector and two 30 pin connectors for USB 3. So you can have a total of five USB 3 ports on the front of your case, and this motherboard will totally support that. One other feature I'll mention of this motherboard is that it has an independent base clock generator, which means that if you want to try to get an overclock running an exotic base uh, front side bus clock speed, like 133 megahertz or 125 megahertz, something like that, you can. So that really helps, or at least in past generations, it used to help with the non-K series CPUs, but you know, since these ninth gen CPUs that are launching are all enthusiast CPUs and the multiplier is unlocked, I don't know how much you're really gonna do with base clock customization unless you're doing like extreme overclocking or something like that but with the base clock overclocking it does give you a little bit more flexibility to squeeze a little bit more performance out of the system because you can't really overclock pci express peripherals and having the base clock thing means that you can run the cpu at a different speed than your peripherals which is a good thing in terms of system stability this motherboard does also have a number of RGB headers in terms of 5050 headers, as well as the digital LED strip headers. It also has a Thunderbolt header. So if you wanted to run Thunderbolt, you can totally do it. Now, the interesting thing with Thunderbolt is that almost always Thunderbolt goes through chipset lanes and not lanes connected directly to the CPU. But in this case, if you were to use the M.2 connector, uh, or if you were to use the bottom PCI Express slot, it would actually run directly through the CPU, not the chipset. Gonna have to get a Thunderbolt card and do some experimentation. Maybe that will be another video. 
Now, in terms of overclocking performance and overclocking support, eight CPUs running at, you know, one contemplates up to 5.3 gigahertz, it's gonna generate a lot of current through the motherboard, which will generate a lot of heat. And that brings us to our VRM, our motherboard VRM. Well, the motherboard VRM in this is advertised as an IR Digital PWM 12 phase power design. And when we actually take a closer look at it, it is 10, uh, it's 10 phases for VCC and two phases for uh, the, the graphics connection, I think. So that's a five phase with phase doublers. Um, and so the PWM controller is an IR35201, that's in a five plus two configuration. And then the uh, doubler, the dual driver, is an IR3598. So there are actually 14 inductors around the perimeter of the CPU, but those are 60 amp inductors. We've got Nishikon 12K capacitors and a TI CSD87350 NextFET for the MOSFETs. With the 8086K running at 5.3 gigahertz and almost 1.4 volts, which is ludicrous, you should never push that much, that, that many volts through an 8086K, running an extreme stress burn-in test, not with the Intel stock cooler, but it was with a Cooler Master 280 millimeter um, closed loop all-in-one. This motherboard uh, got a little warm, maybe the VRM heatsink solution, it's solid as opposed to Fend. The VRM uh, solution could maybe be a little bit better, but it was in our open air test bench. Uh, it, was, it was not alarmingly warm, but maybe just on the side of being alarmingly warm with the 8086K. Now, if you set this up in the case and you have a top fan, like if you had a fan mounted here, I am sure that the VRM heat situation would be no problem. So in terms of 5.3 gigahertz stability with the 8086K the special anniversary edition, yes, this motherboard delivers. And that's nice because with the Tai Chi, they always try to aim for giving you exactly what you need and not what you don't. So like, oh, I'm gonna do some sort of, you know, 5.5 gigahertz ridiculous overclock where my CPU is drawing 450 watts of power. No. It does have uh, one four pin and one eight pin CPU power connector. So theoretically, the theoretical maximum through the connectors there is like 600 watts. I think realistically, it's probably like 500 watts, 450, something like that. And, uh, uh, you know, total system power consumption uh, on the order of like 300 watts, 330 watts, something like that. So in terms of like power delivery, will it give you what you want in terms of reasonable overclockability, even if you happen to get, you know, the top 10% of 9,000 series chips? I can't officially say yes, but probably. <laughs> At least it works great with the 8,000 series chips. So we're gonna do a lot more testing on the 9,000 series chips. Be sure to check out our full performance analysis. Now, in terms of Linux support, the Tai Chi generally are basically flawless for Linux. Uh, this motherboard is no exception. DDR4 4000, of course, was stable. That's what we tested it at. Uh, the, the Intel NICs worked fine. As far as I could tell, the USB uh, setups were working fine. I did not have a USB-C connector to test that, but the USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-A connector at the back of the motherboard worked, so I'm pretty sure that everything else will be fine. All the other rear I.O. is fine. Combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port is fine. The Intel wireless, of course, is supported on Linux. So uh, there wasn't really much uh, there, I mean, this motherboard was ex basically exactly according to plan. Uh, ASRock has reorganized the BIOS a little bit to make it a little bit more organized and a little bit more user-friendly. Uh, if you're, you know, scared of overclocking or whatever, you can basically just go in and turn on multi-core enhancement and be good to go. That, that'll mean that all of your cores will run at whatever the maximum turbo is supported by Intel, which 99% of chips should be able to do that. Like, that should basically be a free overclock as long as you can manage the heat. Now, one final note about the IOMMU grouping situation. Z390 is shaping up to be a little bit weird in terms of the IOMMU grouping on motherboards. And so I'm seeing everything in group one on this particular motherboard for anything that's connected through the PCI Express lanes on the CPU. So the, the by 16 I've got right now, it's by eight by four by four, as I mentioned, but each one of these devices is not isolated from the other. They are all grouped together in the same IOMMU group group one in this case. However, the onboard devices like the M.2s, we got two Samsung 960s in our M.2 slots, as well as some other onboard peripherals, those are all in different IOMMU groups for the most part. Not universally, but for the most part. Be sure to check out the screenshots of the IOMMU on Z390 so that you can make a decision about what it is that you intend to do with the system. We will generally try to populate the system with a bunch of peripherals so that you get some idea 
of how that works. So don't just take my word of saying, oh, it's fine or it's not fine. Actually look at the IOMMU groups and the peripherals that we have in the system in order to make a determination for your specific case. So I really like this board um, overall provided by ASRock. And I really think that, you know, they're, it's, it's weird because Intel just came out with the Z370 stuff and now we have Z390, but we also now have eight core CPUs. And so it makes sense that in some scenarios you would maybe want a newer board. That said, if you can get, you know, a Z370 board on fire sale for your new system, uh, all you're really giving up, you're, tr you're trading a, an Asmedia USB 3.1 Gen 2 controller for an Intel USB 3.1 Gen 2 controller, but the PCI Express layout is also different on this motherboard and perhaps a bit unique because I never saw this kind of a PCI Express layout on Z370 where it's sharing the PCI Express lanes with the CPU. So exciting times. I really honestly prefer this PCI Express layout where the three by 16 slots go through the CPU and a by eight by four by four than through the chipset because that DMI 3.0 interface at this point, especially if you've got high speed peripherals, is basically bottlenecked. So I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and you can find me in the level one forums.